Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the legend and the voice of combat sports, the great philanthropist, Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you feeling? I'm good. Listen, before somebody, I know the people who scrutinize this show, they look really deep, They and we appreciate them. You know, looking quick, looking long, looking deep, looking whatever, as long as you're there looking. We appreciate you all. And um, you like my southern accent, y'all. And, um, <laughs> but before people have to start guessing, no, I didn't make a comeback. No, I didn't get popped in the eye. Um, you didn't well, have a fight with Bob Arum, are you sure? Well, <laughs> I avoid those. Um, the best I can. Yeah, I would avoid that. But um, no, I, I got popped. I got popped because at the at the fights I was covering the UFC fights the other night at the garden and um for ESPN and I it was a pleasure that you guys were there it was really nice to have you and Rob there with me and then Ken was getting really kind of surrounded by so many fans and and mauled um it was getting a little out of hand it was getting a little crazy so I jumped in and you know Stuff started flying. I got <laughs> caught a little bit trying to trying to get Ken out of there. Um, listen, I'm kidding. Um, it could be possible. That could be very possible. But no, I um, I had a procedure done uh, this morning. An eye procedure, no big deal. They removed the sty. Great doctor, Doctor Ray Mustafi, um, did a great job. Uh, I wanted to have an open eye by Thursday when I have a big foundation fundraiser dinner. So he he took care of it uh, this morning. Um, And that's it. We're here. You know, we're like the mailmen. Uh, Maybe even more so sometimes. Neither snow nor rain nor the, you know, dark of night or any of that stuff will stop us from delivering this show. Uh... You know, we've I didn't need a box. recorded it from of, everywhere, Teddy. We've yeah, recorded we, from we, uh, Europe. We've recorded in we blizzards. Find a way. Sundays, we're not going to be stopped by. We're not going to be stopped by trivial stuff. You know, it's our choice, and we make a choice to to do it. And uh, listen, I had a father. Uh, forget about the boxing part of my life. I had a father that was. Uh, he, he didn't need to be a boxer to teach you what uh, professionalism and toughness was. He got surgery in his 70s, major surgery. And the next day, he doesn't stay in the hospital. He goes to the office. <laughs> the only thing, <laughs> the only concession he made to the surgery was that he had to lay on a couch to take care of the patients for that one day. <laughs> one day. So uh, a stupid eye thing um, wasn't going to slow us down. And again, I had a, a special guy a good man in Ray Mustafi who who did it. And I I was so happy to have you guys with me at the garden. It, it really was, it really was really, we'll talk about it, we'll break it all down, but it was a great night. Um, it was extra great having you guys there and having Dustin win. And again, we'll break his fight down, we'll do the whole x-ray that we do, but... To have him there and then have him on the air with me afterwards, uh, breaking his fight down and some of the other fights, it was it was really great. Um, he's a you know he's a friend of ours, but he's just a good person because he's staying uh, to go to the dinner Thursday night. And I got to tell a little funny story. I was thinking about, and I always tell Rob get these clips up. And I know the you know I I love to make the comparisons with some movie stuff when it fits and from rocky 2 that scene ken it was a great scene he's going to the fight right the rematch and on his way to the fight balboa pulls into the church and he yells up hey father carmine uh, rocky what are you doing right in italian though he's talking rocky roger giano what are you doing over here and he goes don't you have a fight to-? yeah yeah but I just wanted to stop by maybe that you could kind of like throw me down a blessing to make sure like I didn't get too beat up tonight, you know? <laughs> um, so I was thinking, I was I was saying prayers um, for Dustin that 
I, I pray for all my family and all my friends anyway, and I pray for this country, to be quite uh, frank, especially lately, um, that we're going to be okay. But I was praying and uh, that he's going to be okay uh, because of the person he is, because of the person he is, because of the kind of fight that he was in. These guys are always in tough fights because of the kind of fight with another monster just like him. He's a savage, and so is Chandler. And, you know, obviously knowing that he was going to come to the dinner and, and show that other side to him, you know, the fighter outside the ring, the champion outside the ring, where he's going to help us raise money to help a lot of a lot of people in tough situations. So I was thinking about that, saying, "Hey, uh, God, please make sure you know he's okay," <laughs> and and thank God he's okay, um, and thank goodness he won. Uh, you know, you you knew win or lose, he was going to leave it all in that cage. That's what Dustin does. That's what a lot of these guys do. Um, what a fight! What a round! Again, we're X-ray the whole thing. Um, and the last thing I want to say, it was just so special night to have my son there. He came in from Vegas. Everybody knows he, he was with the Raiders for 14 years and um, director of scouting out there uh, towards the end. And to have him fly in, he's here for the dinner, of course, but to have him fly in and come to the show with me and be there, it was just great. And then to see all the, just just all the special people that, you know, that are part of the UFC makeup, uh, that, that do the broadcast. Um, they're all, they're just all good people. I mean, they're all competent. They're all real professionals. Tremendous at what they do. Um, Paul Felder, Megan O'Leary, uh, Brett Okamoto, Okamoto, uh, Okamoto, uh, but, Anthony Whatever Smith. you want to pronounce it, that's okay. I, he knows that he's great. And uh, Brian K uh, Custer now is a new man over there. He left Showtime, and he's now he's with ESPN. Sounds like um, Showtime wheels are off. Yeah, Anthony Smith, that's true. It does. They have problems. And Anthony Smith, uh, people are leaving the boat uh, yeah. over at Showtime. But Anthony Smith, uh, all of them. Just, they're, they're special. Look, we know about Joe Rogan in D.C. and John Anik, but the guys that I work with afterwards to do the post-fight breakdown, um, they're, just, they're just the way you would want everybody to be in any profession. Good at what they do and good people. Um, so I wanted to say that and just, again, say how special it was having my son there, having you guys there, having my man Stephen A. there, um, you know, Stephen A. Smith. As a matter of fact, Stephen came over. And we're going to get him on, people. Um, send your comments. Do you, you how, how, how much would you like to see us do a show with Stephen A.? Because <laughs> he first thing he said to me, well, f after saying hello and giving me a hug, because I love him. I love his family. Uh, his sister. I love his sister more than him. But, I mean, I love him. I love him, too. Um, but uh, his sister talks a little less a little less and um but uh great person like him he he really does he comes from a great family any good people i don't know usually they come from good stock you know they might have come from rough places but they come from good stock and um it was that good stock that overcame where they came from that allowed them to overcome wherever they had to overcome uh to get to where they get to um but anyway, he, he says to me after after we were there a few minutes, he says, Teddy, you got to get me on your podcast. I said, yeah. He goes, I love it. So it was nice to hear that, again, we always say there's a lot of people out there watch our show in the industry. And we know that. We know that from personal experience and people telling us and other ways too. But... It's nice to hear someone like Stephen A. Smith who's so successful and who's just, it's not because he's successful. He's successful at being a human being. And that's, that's a success. They, you you got to work at that, baby. <laughs> you got to work at that. that. That's something that matters. That's something that um, should be talked about sometimes. People that are successful at being a good human being. But anyway, he wants to come on the show. I said, yeah. Uh, we'll try to fit you in, Stephen. We'll we'll, we'll we'll figure it out. We'll try to 
We'll try to get you in there. So, And he's going to be, again, speaking to the kind of person he is, he's flying in from Kansas City on Thursday night, on uh, Thursday afternoon, Thursday morning. I think it's Kansas City, wherever. He's probably doing NBA stuff. They got him all over the place. And he says, I'm going to try to be there. I'm going to fly in. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to try to be there. He usually is there. And there's going to be so many Dustin, you, Rob. I, I appreciate you guys um, coming. Uh, are you back home, Ken? Yes. Uh, so you flew back home. See, I got to say this. You flew back home to Tennessee, and yet you're flying back in Thursday to be with your family and then flying back for the dinner. So I for me- I miss it. Yeah, but that's friendship. That's that's character. That's loyalty. That that that's all the that's the reason of those are the people I want to be around. Those are, that's success. That's success, right there to me, and well, the and that gives and that gives me success to have those kind of people around. Same thing for Rob, and um, you guys are taking the table, the whole thing. I just wanted to say that, and I want to say it in a form like this. I want to, I want to say it. Um, so anyway, uh, take it from there, kid. Uh, yeah, I, just, I wanted to say about the, about the event. It was excellent to be with you in the ESPN broadcast booth. I had the best time. I was actually, I'm pissed. I didn't send the text earlier, but I'll tell you now. I wanted to tell you. Tell Teddy Jr. It was great hanging out. It was the most time I've ever spent with him one on one. We watched the fights together. We were both like two little kids jumping around when Dustin won. It was just so much fun to be with someone who's like shares a passion for the sport. And uh, of course, you were head down tweeting up a storm. So we didn't get much FaceTime, but uh, it was fun. Loved meeting Stephen A. Smith. Soon as I walked in before you got there, Anthony Smith comes running over, recognized me. It was so, I, I'm always so shocked when anyone recognized me, but to a legend like Anthony not me, Smith. Not me anymore. Not me anymore. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to put a, I'm going to get you a new shirt. Maya. Maya, baby. <laughs> and, I, and, and then I talked a long time to Paul Felder, who's now a former UFC fighter, now a like, uh, triathlon legend, big endurance sport guy. And, and uh, we talked a lot about running and triathlon. It was just, it was an awesome night. And then, like you said, Dustin to win. And just to give people an idea of what kind of person Dustin is, we, I, I consider him a very good friend. He's been here to Nashville. We've had dinner with him and his wife, me and my wife. And, and I text him a few times the week of the fight. And I said, hey, if you're around, let's get lunch or dinner. And he didn't respond. And I was telling my wife this. It's very easy when you send a text to someone and you don't get a response to make it all about you like how dare they don't respond to me and for whatever reason he had a few he had a little important stuff going on ken i mean you know maybe you know like a fight at the garden with our savage go ahead (laughs) when he sees he comes into the broadcast booth and everyone's there Stephen a felt that you and he said he comes running over gives me a hug he's like hey i'm sorry i didn't get back to you i just was in the zone he goes Man, I've been like, this This fight had me on edge. And I think he said it on, on interviews since then. Like, yeah, man, I was afraid to fight Chandler. He's a tough guy. Of course I was afraid. But he came over and he was like, I'm sorry. I only didn't respond because I was like in a place what where do I, I don't always like say? To. What do I always say? And that's confirmation again. Yep. Well, well, not that I'm always right. But that's confirmation. I always say anyone who says they're not afraid, they're one of two things. The great Costamato said this. They're, they're one of two things. And I've I've... I've lived to testify to it over 50 years that he was right on the button. Anyone who said and lived through it by being in the ring and everything else, anyone who says they're not afraid, they're one of two things. They're either a liar or they need to go to a doctor and find (laughs) out what's wrong with them because fear is supposed to be there for a reason. It's put, put there by God, by nature, whatever you want to believe in, but it's been put in there for a reason, to keep you alive, to have you ready when the moment calls for you to be ready. It, it, it's, it's our greatest enemy, everyone thinks, but the truth is, and I always say this when I'm asked to speak to, to different, I'm asked to speak to businessmen, to CEOs, to, to base basketball teams, football teams, whatever, NFL, and I'm asked to speak, and the first thing that I say is, hey, you guys got to get rid of that notion that you got to push away fear that it's, it's your enemy. It's your best friend. Embrace it. Understand it. 
Control it. Don't let it control you. It's your best friend. It's, it's been put there for a reason. You can't live without it. You would die every day without it. You would walk across the street. You wouldn't look to see if a car's coming. Why? Because you wouldn't be afraid. But you're no. But it tells you, be afraid. Look, make sure you don't get hit by a car. It's there. It's, it's to be used. It's, it's, not, it's not an enemy. It's a gift. A gift from nature. A gift from God. A gift that's kept us around. So anyway, um, that, and that speaks to it. Here you got one of the great fighters, one of the real savages, one of the real live samurais. And these guys are samurais. And, and he's telling you that. Yeah, and it was it was just excellent to see him. And uh, for fans, I think you might be sold out for Thursday night. But if people want no, to no, meet- no, we're past, we're beyond sold out. No, no, okay. but but no, go say what you want to say, and then and then I'll blame you when people get turned away at the door. Um, if there but, are empty uh, seats, and I, yeah, Thursday yeah, but, night Hilton Hotel on Staten Island. Come meet Teddy. Dustin, a whole host, Stephen A. Smith, a whole host of celebrities, and you can even take a picture with me. But I'm yeah, sure that, you're there for, I'm sure that, that last, there for the others. That last part <laughs> might make that last part to make sure we don't sell out. That last part, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We have to have humor and love. And um, I remember my father would always say to me, "He, my father wasn't a man of a lot of words, but when he said something, I I always listened." I remember one time he was telling me about this book. He read a lot of books. He believed in reading, not, you know. And um, I remember him saying that there was this book about this tough guy in a bob, cowboy out west back in the day. And some guy came in a bar didn't realize, you know, thinking he could talk any way he wanted to people. And he talks to this real, real rough guy, serious guy. He says, he calls him a son of a B, you know. I know on this, you're allowed to curse, but I don't believe it. I don't, I try not to do that. I make a choice not to do that. Not that I'm perfect, not that I don't use bad language sometimes, but I just choose not to do it on a program where, you know, different people are listening and kids, whatever. I don't want to represent myself that way or the show that way. So I, um, so he said the guy called him a son of a bee. This tough guy looks at him, stands up, looks at him like, you know, he's going to crush him. And he says to him, smile when you say that, partner. And, and that always stayed with me. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. It's, it's how you say it. It's what, the intent in your heart is, you know, where it's coming from. And there's so much truth to that. There's so much truth to that, you know. But I digress. Um, it's better than regressing. I'll tell you that much. It's better to digress <laughs> than regress. You know, I've regressed a couple of times on this show. And that's the beauty of the show, the purity of the show, the natural part of the show. So, are you, I'm not going to steal anything. Are you ready to, I won't use that word for <laughs> any of the buffers. I won't steal any of the buffers. Are you ready? Are you ready to, I won't use a, I won't use the last sentence. Um, but are you guys ready to break down some fights? Because me and Ken are. Hey guys, want to take a second to give a shout out to our newest sponsor, Olipop. We've been talking about them the last couple of weeks. Healthy alternative to traditional sodas. I love this stuff. It's got um, it's got prebiotics, botanical and plant botanicals and plant fiber. The plant fiber is important because two out of three Americans say they suffer from digestive issues. This plant fiber is uh, is a nice addition to a can of soda. I like to treat myself to a soda after a workout. Um, Unlike Coca-Cola, which has 39 grams of sugar, Olipop only has two grams, at least two grams in this cream soda flavor, which is one of my favorites. But more than that, I like to share this with my children. I give it to them as a reward. They love soda. If your kids are like mine, you probably struggle to keep them from uh, wanting soda all the time. But this is something I can feel good about sharing them with at sharing with them at dinner. Um, 
Use the go to go to drinkolipop.com and use the promo code Atlas to save 25% off your first order. Again, promo code Atlas, save 25% at drinkolipop.com. Also want to give a shout out to our new sponsor, Hoist IV Level Hydration. This stuff is clear in color, unlike Gatorade and some of the other major, uh, some of the mainstream hydration drinks with all the colors and all the other additives that aren't necessarily good for you. Hoist has none of that. Simple flavors, I prefer watermelon here. I love this stuff. I drink this immediately after a workout. Um, get yourself rehydrated. Go to drinkhoist.com and use the promo code ATLAS20. That's ATLAS, A-T-L-A-S, 20 to save 20% off your order at drinkhoist.com. Let's jump right into it with a couple quick hits on the early cards from the, on the early fights from the main card. And uh, first one was uh, super entertaining, but only because one guy clearly only wanted to use one technique against a mixed martial artist like Dan Hooker in Dan Hooker's fight against uh, Claudio Pulez. I hope I'm saying that right, Pulez. We were at the event, so I didn't hear the announcers pronounce it. But Pulez is clearly a, uh, a Peruvian kid who's clearly a master at uh, leg locks, ankle locks. But as I said about Hooker, that's a mixed martial artist. If you come with one move against him and you can't get him, it, it was that fight. It was kind of embarrassing for Pulez, honestly, for a guy in the UFC to be so one dimensional. He was literally at the end just diving for for um, Hooker's ankles for two straight rounds. And finally, Hooker just kept staying away, staying away. He almost got him a couple of times and Hooker kept staying away and then finally ended it with a body kick. Beautiful kick right up the middle, hit him in the so right below the solar plexus. It looked like he got right under his ribs with his toes and shut it down. And after um, he went down, the ref just stepped in and waved it off because it was clear Pulas wasn't going to engage. He only wanted to try to get a leg lock and it was so... I don't know. I'm, I guarantee that the UFC brass is not happy with this kid coming in with that his being his only weapon in this at this level, Teddy. As you know, you need you need a full you need the full package. You cannot have weaknesses, and if you're going to get picked apart on your feet and hope to get someone to the ground, and you don't have a technique to get him to the ground to get through the storm, as you would say, to get through the dangerous neighborhood. You ain't going to last long. This these people are too good, too well rounded. So Hooker gets the stoppage second round. What'd you think? Well, here's where it's a problem. Uh, everything you said, yes, he's a, he was a one-trick pony. But here's the problem. That one trick was not exciting. See, that's the problem. That's where, that's where lies the problem. Because you got to put fannies in the seat. Because this is about the brand. That's why they put competitive fights. That's why it's, no, it's Dano's White way or the highway that's that's why there's no free lunch that's why everyone no free lunch no layups no slam dunks you know uh, look at poor molly molly got destroyed uh you know um I, i'm not uh, what's her full name me me paul molly mccann molly mccann you know they were like a a, a duel uh a duet if you will um her you know, hum and Patty the Batty, and they were building her up, and she's great. She's great. She's fun. She's great. She's tough, like they all are. But she, she, she got steamrolled. You know. Well, we should uh, give a shout out to Alan, Aaron Blanchfield, who literally just—I mean, it was so dominant. It was. I felt bad for Molly. She was a big fan no, uh, 100%. favorite. But my God, did she get 100%. steamrolled? But it goes You're to right. show you again, speaking to what we say. You know, uh, no free lunch. I mean, here's nope. a, a budding star, yet, you know, look what they, you know, they didn't do any favors. So that was a British girl, Teddy, who was getting a chance in the in the Madison Square Garden while they were booing a girl from New York. It was crazy. And the girl from New York wasn't having it. She was so much better. Oh. I mean, she, oh my God, what a performance from Aaron Blanchfield. She made the most of a moment. Old. Yeah. She wasn't 100%. intimidated. She came in and she did her thing. This was her chance. And she made the most of it. Maybe next time she's on a main event card. But that's how it works. That's how it works in life. You don't complain. You don't make excuses. You get your moment. You make the most of it. You're ready for that moment. You're ready for that moment. So, And you take all the bad moments and you help those moments get you ready for the moment. Yeah, that's what you do. That's what winners do. And um, she did that. But uh, again, the problem with Pulas 
was this one trick was not entertaining because you want to keep the ball moving down the field. I remember that great uh, clip with Hank Stram years ago in one of the early Super Bowls with the Kansas City uh, Chiefs, and they had a mic. I think it was the first time they mic'd the coach. They had a mic to and again, and I think they beat the heck out of the Vikings, whoever it was. I, I can't remember, but uh, he's he's on the sideline with his hat on, his suit, nice cashmere coat on. It was cold wherever it was, and he's got the program rolled up in his hand, and he's slapping the program together, and he's saying, "Keep just keep matriculating that ball downfield, boys. Just keep matriculating that ball downfield." Well, that's kind of what Dana White believes in doing matriculating the ball downfield keep the brand moving keep the brand growing and and how do you do it competitive fights exciting fights and Pulas for change did not fit that bill and you said it right a rarity a rarity but he you know he was a he was a I take nothing away from him. He's gutsy enough to get in that. He's an expert. He gets in that octagon. He's more brave than most people. But he was a pebble in the shoe of the UFC that night. And uh, that pebble got removed with a solarplex kick. And the only reason I say I'm not dismissing him, I'm not in any way trying to be, uh, of course, disrespectful. I'm just making a point that he didn't fit in to the mantra. He didn't fit into the regular, the conventional. Not just because the style was bad. Yeah, his style, the thing about his style, yeah, it was awkward. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, it was different. Yeah, it was not conventional. But yeah, it was boring. That was the problem. And that's where the problem came. You know, he basically threw himself on the floor and if he couldn't grab your legs, he laid there like a crab, you know, kicking up at you. And, um, you know, unless you're in a restaurant, you don't want to see a crap. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. And, yep. and, and if you're in a restaurant, you want to see it, you know, on your plate. So it reminded me going way back, 40 years, whatever the heck it was, to Muhammad Ali doing one of the first ever crossover events with a Japanese guy. I think his, way was, his name was Anoki. Uh, you guys look it up. You, you, you guys make me look good. Make sure I don't look bad. But I think it was Anoki. It was one of the first... Now they do these things all the time. But Inoki, it was one of the... I-N-O-K-I. I -I, yeah, I had it. Inoki. And Antonio they, Inoki. There it is. I, 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 my memory's pretty damn good. June and, 26, 1976. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and what it... They, they had him in there with this famous, you know, karate expert master from japan and they made an event ali got paid like seven million dollars if i remember correctly which was unheard of unheard of astronomical it's still big money but compared to what's out there today it, it it's not you know it's not it's not astonishing this was astonishing back in those days and the great muhammad ali gets in there with him again these things weren't happening back then and he gets in the ring with him and what does the guy do with all the fanfare, with all the, you know, hoopla, uh, he lays on his back and, and he's kicking the shins of Ali all night long. And Ali, of course, named him because of his style was not too exciting and because of what he was doing, he quickly dubbed him the crab. The crab. And um, Ali, you know, nicknamed everybody. Sonny Lister was the bear. You know, Floyd Patterson was the rabbit. You know, he gave everybody uh, different kinds of nicknames. So he gets kicked in the leg so much that it was a non-eventful night. Everybody was booing and everything else. And he, you know, he got seven million, whatever the money was, crazy money. But he also had to go to the hospital alley and get blood clot, gets treated for blood clots in his legs from all the kicks to the shins. So this reminded me a little bit of that, uh, where you know you just. You're watching this and you're like, this ain't exactly what I bargained for. You know, just like the people back then, they didn't bargain to see that with Inoki. They didn't bargain to see that, I don't think, with Pules. Um, But at the end of the day, Hooker got him out of there. And you know the part with the Solarplex front kick? The part that I liked about this was this. We just spent time once again making it clear that nobody gets a free lunch. Hooker has been in with nothing but beast. Beast. 
I mean, one after another. I mean, he's like he's like in a Freddy Krueger movie. I mean, he is. I mean, the goblins and ghouls and everything, and he deserved a break. He deserved an easy one. He really did. You know, I don't. I don't think they planned it that way exactly, but it turned out that way. He he deserved a little bit of a break, uh, a little bit of a reprieve from the hailstorm of monsters that were coming his way. And I'm glad. I was glad for him. I really was. For that reason, he earned it. And the referee did the right thing. He ended it with, you know, I mean, the kick ended it, but he he quickly made sure he stopped it. Matter of fact, I think he even penalized Pulez or warned him at one point for not fighting. Um, which I've never seen in the UFC. I've seen it in boxing, but I've never seen it in the UFC before. Um, But again, I finish with, I always say, boxing always says, styles make fights. Well, the style of Pulas, in this case, unmade fights. Some styles unmake fights, and this was one of them. Yeah, it it wasn't good at all, (laughs) to say the least. Um Next one I wanted to touch on. Oh, this was a hard one to watch. Frankie Edgar and Chris Gutierrez. Sad, uh, sad, bad, sad, Ken. Bad, bad matchup for Frankie from the jump. Uh, what, this is the one. Uh, I watched a few fights with our, friend, with our producer, Rob, and his uh, friend, Andrew Huberman, the neuroscientist. And um, they were saying, what do you think here? And I said, Frankie is, I love Frankie. I'm a huge fan. But I said, he's been around for like 40 years. And I think that this is a terrible matchup and doesn't end well for him. No, I didn't, and like you would say, doesn't make me the great Nostradamus. But no, no it doesn't I make you the amazing Kretzkin. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. So I didn't get the words out of my mouth before Gutierrez hits him with that flying knee, knocks Frankie out cold. And the scary part is, you know, as you know, when you get knocked out and fall back on the canvas and your head bounces off the canvas, it creates a very dangerous situation for concussions. You know, the head's moving in one direction, stops short, the brain crashes against the skull, the skull on the inside and creates a potential for a brain bleed. It was just scary. Frankie's family and kids Do you want were to scare anybody inside. anymore, Ken, or you're done? I yeah, mean, it was, it was uh, scary. So uh, Gutierrez gets the win. God, Halloween's I hate to not see, around the corner. You hate wow. to see Frankie go out like that. It was billed as his retirement fight. Anytime you tell someone it's a it's a retirement fight, Paul Felder was saying this too after the fight. As soon as you start, start saying it's a retirement fight, that usually is the is not a good sign, and it wasn't the UFC on brand for how they would normally behave no soft touches even on your retirement fight here you get Gutierrez and just cleans out Frankie in a bad way scary moment um what'd you think it was sad that's Very. all I can tell you it was sad to see I don't like to see legends this guy's a former champ he's a legend he's a monster you don't like to see him go and no more than I want to see Ali go out with Holmes the way he did no more than I want to see the great Joe Lewis go out with Marziano the way he did when they were way past themselves and they shouldn't have been in the ring. You know, Edgar's what, 42 years old? You know, so he, he the guy was too young, too explosive, too just too explosive, too quick. I mean, he was explosive. He was quick. Um, and he was young, younger, obviously. Uh, it was a bad... It was a bad style to have him in there with at this point in his life. Maybe it would always be a tough style to be in with a guy this explosive uh, and this talented and athletic, but definitely bad at this point in Edgar's life. It was sad for me to see. Um, it, it, it really was. It was reminiscent of the flying kick that Masvidal knocked out Askren with, Ben Askren with, where you know he, he came up with that knee uh and you know it was night it was lights out it was uh edgar was all class afterwards uh just like you'd expect ken uh from a you know from a proud warrior a true warrior and a follower of the code i talk about the code a lot ken you know there's a guy who's a follower of the code of behavior for such honorable and tough men so he was consistent with that he was exactly what you would expect uh a guy like edgar you know, to say and act uh, afterwards, especially if it's his retirement fight. So that's it. That's all I have to, well, what movie is that? And that's all I have to say about that. 
Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to remember. What movie is that, Sam? My man Sam here. Um, uh, which one? And that's all I have to say about that. Oh, oh, that might have been... Um, that. That's an... Uh, uh, Forrest Gump. Exactly, <laughs> my man, my man, the Rob Moore. Word, the word of God comes over. Yeah, the word uh, of God. Like, the word of like God. The ESPN producer it's from Forrest the truck. Gump. <laughs> Forrest Gump. Wow. Um, yeah, that was Forrest Gump, and that's all I have to say. And and my mama, my mama always said that life was like a box of chocolates. <laughs> Speaking of Forrest Gump, my friend Stacy Feinerman, her sister um, Karen was the producer and won the Oscar for best production on uh, Forrest Gump. Just to do a little name the drop list. in here. Well, well, just a little, <laughs> just a little. Um, <laughs> I can yeah. just hear the audience like, "What an ass Ken is!" You'd, name dropping, uh, but she is my friend. <laughs> yeah, but they wouldn't know it was you if you didn't name drop. <laughs> they, they wouldn't, oh, they'd on. say, was that Ken? <laughs> or was that just another guy, a good-looking guy in good shape? <laughs> no, it's Ken. It's Ken. It's, it's the Ken that we know <laughs> and we love and we expect. Hey guys, want to take a second to shout out to Athletic Greens, one of our original OG sponsors. These guys have been with us from the beginning. AG1, I love this stuff. I drink it every single day. These travel packs that um, these travel packs that they sell are invaluable to me when I'm on the road. Again, every day take it prebiotics, probiotics, all the vitamins that you need, an all-in-one drink. When you take an Athletic Greens, you don't need any other supplements, and I consider it an insurance policy for my health and immune system especially when i'm traveling if you go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas they'll send you 10 free travel packs with your first purchase again athleticgreens.com slash atlas to get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase now we get into the now we get into one of the highlights now we get into the friend, deep waters deep waters deep waters our friend deep dustin Poirier puts it on uh chandler they uh dustin clearly wins the first round what a first they, round what a first thank round god, thank god for chandler i don't know if he clearly won with, ken i don't know if chandler clearly won that first round the way no, that no, dustin Poirier, came back Poirier oh, clearly oh, won. I if, you that, said if that ring if that round didn't end if there were five to ten more seconds Chandler was almost out on his feet. He was getting cracked right when the bell was sounded. What a round. When he, when he went to sit down, he almost fell down. And There was um, two and, fights in that round, Ken. Yes. There were yep. two fights. 100%. Unbelievable. And then Chandler clearly wins the second round. He got on top of Dustin and just rode him the whole fight. Didn't do much with it, but he held him down. And maybe a 10 a round. You know, maybe. just to build the drama a little bit more for where... where Poirier was going into the third and final round that he might have been he might have been behind he might have needed that stoppage the only reason I don't give him a 10-8 round there is because he didn't do anything with the position he just held him down he didn't do anything to, Poirier didn't seem to ever be in danger of being stopped it just it ground. just listen it could have been a possibility yeah I'll tell you one thing I'm with you. I'll tell you one thing Poirier probably put it in his head that he was treating it like it was a 10-8 round. That in other yeah. words, I got to go do what I got to do here. Yeah. And he went it, and he did what he had to do. Yeah, he said he thought he definitely lost. He said, I figured we would tie going into the last. But the last round, oh my God, what a round. Poor, um, the, in the finishing sequence, Chandler picks Dustin up with like a high crotch single leg and scoops him up. And Chandler is so damn strong. And he picked him up. And Dustin, right as he was about to slam Dustin in very dramatic fashion, Dustin shifted his weight and laid across almost like an upside down piggyback on Chandler's back, which caused Chandler to not quite slam him the way he wanted. And when they hit the ground, a, a, a scramble ensues and Poirier lassos his leg around Chandler's waist, gets him in a body triangle, slaps on a neck crank and sinks in a rear naked choke and, and stops it. But before that, one of the things Dustin said, he said it in the ring, but when he came up and was talking to us in the booth, he said to me, he goes, yeah, man, that guy stuck his fingers in my mouth and grabbed the top. Well, he didn't say it just mouth. us. Ken, he didn't save that exclusively for us. He said I, that on the air to Logan. I know, but I'm telling you what he told me privately was that he oh. he said, you wouldn't believe, he goes, I thought I was like, he, he was going to pull my teeth out. He said he well, pulled he so hard that. and he goes, and when he was pulling it, he goes, I bit his finger so hard I can't believe the finger didn't come off. He goes, I bit his finger as hard as I could and I was trying to tell the ref, but 
Chandler, who is uh, usually a pretty classy guy. You think that would have? Uh, what do you think that would have? The, the ratings would have went up with the, <laughs> if there was a couple of fingers spit out of the mouth. Yeah, I mean, but really, I, that, I, would just, I mean, they'd I would still just be watching. This, they'd still Chan be watching the way things, you know. Yeah, Chandler seems like a classy guy and a nice guy. I know he's got a lot of mutual friends here in Nashville, but man, there's something about having integrity when you're in there and trying to f compete. There's, you know, there's not many rules in the UFC, just man rules. You can't be fish hooking people and trying to hurt someone. And God forbid he got that choke in because I don't think the ref even caught it because yeah, one but, hand but was I'll covering go, and the other hand was going in the mouth. But I'll go back to when we were kids and, you know, you were playing basketball in the in the streets and in the, in the playgrounds and stuff. Prison rules? And, no, I mean, everything was going, you know, all kinds of stuff, whatever. You know, like no blood, no foul, right? That yeah. kind of thing. But then if you started cheating, that's a little different. That's yes. where you're going over the line. 100%. And, you know, and I remember we had a saying, CNP, CNP, cheaters never prosper. And, yep. and you know, it, it kind of played out a little bit that way. And look, I'm taking nothing away from Chandler. He's a warrior. The guy's a warrior. The guy shows nothing but, uh, in, in, you know, what a warrior should show when he fights. But that stuff shouldn't be happening. But uh, we'll get past that. And the first thing that I have to say about this fight is that Chandler has now become what Arturo Gatti and Mike Tyson were. Very few people become this. A guy that it doesn't matter if he wins or loses. He's still going to make money. He's still going to be a draw. He's going to still do big numbers. People, and he's still going to get big fights because of what he brings into the arena. He brings action. He, he brings a threat. He 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 brings danger. He brings explosiveness. You know, I mean, he brings a car crash. And and people like to watch car crashes whether you like to admit it or not. He he brings action. He's one of the rare guys that can lose and his contract's going to continue. And for good reason because of what I just said. And there's very few people. People still watch Arturo Gatti when he was losing because they knew what they were going to get. Action. War. War. They still watch Mike Tyson when he wasn't Mike Tyson because they might get a knockout or they might get someone's head bit off or ear bit off or thrown out of the ring. Uh, not good. Not good. But they're going to... Their, their, curi their morbid curiosity in that case made them come and watch even when he was no longer that athlete. He was no longer that fighter because people were going to be entertained in a good or bad way. They were going to be entertained. And that's what Chandler does. He entertains you. And maybe now he goes to the persona of bad guy with the fingers up in him. I don't know. I mean, that's getting a little bit like WWE. That's getting like the old wrestling when you had the bad. So I don't want to get there. Not with a serious sport like this. Because this sport is too dangerous and too damn serious. But I think the point is worth me making that I should make that point that, you know, because these guys do pick up personas. They do pick up personalities. They, they understand that just like no McGregor one played, did. No one, no one played the bad guy better than the great Chell Sonnen. Chell Sonnen is great. And I miss him. I'm not afraid to say I miss him. I, I want him to be back. I, I miss him. But anyway, I digress for two seconds. Um, but for a good two seconds, I miss him. He's a good man, and, and he's a hell of a, just like the rest of them. They're all qualified. Uh, he's a smart guy like that Anthony Smith, and, and he tells you the truth. He tells you the truth, and he's damn good at what he does. And, it, and if he's uh, he hearing this, there. a lot of people, talent and behind-the-scenes people at the ESPN booth were commenting on the fact that they can't wait to get him back, and they hope he's back soon. And Yeah, that's we'll why I said it. I, I, yeah, I know, I yeah. know. I just and, want to let him know that a lot of people are saying it, and uh, we well, miss him. Look, um, again, he... Conor McGregor made millions of dollars. He's a pioneer. Like him, hate him. It don't matter. Like Muhammad Ali. He was a great promoter, great fighter too, great striker, great counterpuncher. You know, during his time, he got it done. He got it done. 
exciting fashion. He lived up to what he said he was going to do. And he promoted the hell out of the sport, the hell out of himself. And he made millions, zillions of dollars. Brought it to another level of money. Brought it to another level. Yeah, like Ali did. And he he created an image. And and there's other guys following suit. You know, Patty the Batty. Um, who, who's the Irish kid with the hair color, all different color hair? Um, that's uh, really... Uh, well, he's really Dan good. Hook, Dan Hooker no, no, was no, like the Irish that. Kid. Oh, you're talking no, that, uh, Sean O'Malley. Yeah, O'Malley. I mean, all these guys. Uh, they're, they're all building a little bit... Uh, the only guy who didn't really have one, there's a few, but a guy like Khabib, he just went and just just destroy guys that was his hook that was his that was his mantra but these guys besides being good besides being dangerous they're developing personas personalities you know labels identities um in the hope of making more of an attraction more money because they're supposed to make money look at the way they're risking themselves they, 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 they're supposed to make money. They, they got to make money. And I'm so happy for Poirier. Um, but again, Chandler is a guy that I don't think he's in danger losing fight. First of all, he's losing to top guys. And because of the way he loses, always in wars, always in knock em, dog, knock em, rock em, sock em, robot type fights, PS6 brawls. So... There's always going to be, until he can't do it no more, a market for a guy like him. Um, and you got to give him credit. You give Poirier credit, he's fought everybody to get there. He earned his way. Rough road. He did it the right way. And he learned. And that's why he became what he became now. He became better later than he was early because of what he went through. Because he went through all those rough patches. Because he fought everybody. The opposite of what boxing does. They protect everybody. They, they, they keep everyone's record undefeated so the promoter can make money. They don't care about the audience. The, that uh, network, the, they don't care either until nobody watches no more and they're going out of bed. And they, it's a little too late to care. But they build the records up and, and the fighter doesn't really get the fight. The fans don't get the fights they want, but the fighter doesn't get the fights they need to become the best fighter they, become, they can become right then. To face what they got to face, to bring out the best of themselves. And sometimes they get to a point, even with their 200 amateur fights and with their glossy record, they get to a point where they got to fight a guy with a few losses, but the guy went through the fire. The guy learned what they didn't learn by fighting those kind of fights. And sometimes, all of a sudden, they realize on that one night, oh my God, I should have fought these kind of guys earlier where I would have gotten what I needed to get because I don't have it right now. I, I'm not ready for this guy in front of me right now. That happens sometimes. Like I always say, there used to be a commercial. I think it was a, a Fram oil filter commercial. Pay me now. The guy would say, pay me now or pay me later. One way or another, you're going to pay. Either you're going to face what you got to face early or you're going to face it late. And late might be worse. It might be better off. And these UFC guys, they face it early. Dustin Poirier, he faced it early. And look what he became. Look at the monster he became. So, and, and Chandler, ever since he came to the UFC, you know, Customato would have said, hey, do these guys hate him? That's what Cus would have said. The, I remember one time we had a fighter in the ring, and um, the father put him in the ring with with a guy that he shouldn't have been in the ring with. And Cus turns to me and says, "If you didn't know better, you'd think this father hated the kid." And and uh, you know, some people might say that about you know the uh, Chandler being brought over to the to the UFC. Some people would say, "Hey, what, what did he make an enemy over here?" I mean, he's been given nothing but one savage after another. You know, first he got Godzilla, like I like to say. Then he got King Kong. Then then he got uh, the Wolfman. And then he got, I mean, it's just one after another. So anyway, great, great fight. Great night. That first round reminded me of Arturo Gatti Ward, the first one. It was like, a chapter in someone's life in that one round. Reading a chapter, a story of someone's life. Uh, two different rounds, like I said earlier. Like two different fights. Early on, incredible. 
I mean, Poirier's in bad trouble. Up against uh, Cage, he's in bad trouble, Ken. And you and me are like, oh, 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 come on, come on. But what's he doing? He's got a great chin, great constitution, great heart like they all do. Great experience. The great experience. He didn't panic. He stayed there. He's slipping, he's sliding, he's slipping and whipping, and, and he's making some of them miss. And what does he say? He's such an honest guy. He's such an honest warrior. What does he say to Rogan after the fight? He says, thank goodness some of those punches were looped and they weren't straight. Otherwise, I might have had a worse problem. And you know he what? Said he, he, he said uh, he might have gotten me out of there because I was hurt. That gets me. That speaks to what I say all the time. Technique matters. Being mm -hmm. taught teachers out there matter. Being taught right matters. That, you know, yeah, talent matters. Yeah, power matters. Yeah, speed matters. But if you don't have the right technique with that talent, it's not going to be as effective or as efficient as it should be. Technique matters. It matters. And you had not only proof of it by watching, you had proof of it by the man telling you afterwards that I'm glad his punches weren't straight, that they were round. But anyway, he's slipping, he's dipping, he's dipping, and, and he's... And the one mistake, he, he got hurt pretty bad, uh, Poirier, but because of who he is, he stayed there. But the one thing that I thought was a mistake, you watch mistakes, and I see them, and I'm here to report them to the fans. The mistake that I felt I saw by, Poor, uh, by Chandler was he's got the offensive flow. He's got him Poirier in trouble. He's got him up against the, the cage. And he decides to do what? He decides to take him down to the floor. I was like, that, I'm glad he did. Like, that's, that's a mistake. Because look, I'm not afraid to say we're rooting for a friend. You know, we're still going to call it right. I'm still going to call it before the fight, after the fight, during the fight the right way. But I'm not going to lie and say I'm not rooting for the guy. I'm going to be professional enough to separate that when I have to do my job. And I do that. And I'm doing it now. But I thought it was a mistake when Chandler picked him up, took him to the floor, and it, it broke up that flow. It stopped, you know, it got him out of that trouble. Yeah, he's, he was still had to deal with him on a mat. I get it. But it was different. And he took away that offensive flow of punches right there and gave him a little break, gave him a reprieve. And it made me think, because people ask me this, Teddy, what do you think about Chandler? You know, he's like a kamikaze pilot. You know, he, he crashes into the ship. Um, what do you think about him? You think there's something beyond that he's just, you know, exciting, that there is kamikaze there? You know, it's worth thinking about. It's worth exploring if you want to go to the deep dive. And we go to deep dives here, to the psychological part. Because I always say 75% of this business is mental. 75% of everything in life to be successful. Every fight in life is mental. To take that dive into this, which most people wouldn't, quite frankly, I, it reminded me a little bit of Oscar De La Hoya. De La Hoya was a tremendous fighter. Some people would say a great fighter. Tremendous fighter. A multiple division champion, different weight classes. Tremendous fighter. Olympic gold medalist. Great fighter. Really good fighter. All right. All his biggest fights, you could argue his most important fights, but most, all his biggest, biggest fights, whether it was Mosley, whether it was Mayweather, whether it was Trinidad, you with me, people? You with me? He always found a way to blow it. He always found a way to do something that didn't make sense. Against Trinidad, the last three rounds, he, he ran. He moved when he, when he was way ahead. Like, just keep doing what you're doing. But he thought that was the right way to do it. Against Mosley, you know... Mosley makes an adjustment. He's winning the fight. Mosley makes an adjustment. He doesn't adjust. I don't know. Against uh, the great Mayweather. You know, he, he's given Mayweather hell with the jab on the outside because Mayweather's a great counter puncher. But if you use your jab and it's long enough, you give him nothing to counter. And, and he's controlling the outside well. And his trainer has to take some blame, the trainer that came in for that fight, but whatever. And, and he's, you know, he's um, just like I got to take blame if I'm in the corner. But he's, he's fighting, he's winning on the outside, giving Mayweather trouble, not allowing him to counterpunch. And what does he do? He goes inside where 
Mayweather could count a punch. Where Mayweather could make a miss and make him pay. Where Mayweather could get his hands on him. I mean, like, why? Why'd you do that? Why'd you screw up? That was a screw up. Why'd you screw up? Do you want to lose? You don't want to lose. Of course not. But why'd you screw up? What's going on under this pressure? Because this is unusual, uncommon pressure. This is not common pressure that people are under when they're in the ring. And pressure can make people do crazy things. It can make wires short circuit. Why did the wires short circuit? And, and you go and fight the wrong fight, a fight that winds up losing the fight for you. Did you think, was it a weakness in different areas? Did you think you had an edge because you were supposed to be the bigger guy? Because that was a big deal. He was supposed to be the bigger guy than Mayweather in that fight. So inside, maybe you have an edge inside. You're stronger. You're more physical. That's not how the fight was played out. Maybe, and, and a lot of people say, well, at least he showed guts. He went inside. Is that guts or is that stupidity? Or is that weakness? Oh, Teddy, how's that weakness? You're going to a guy. You're going to a guy. Um, well, it, it could be weakness in a way that it's easier to go inside where you could hide from some stuff. Oh, yeah, I said it. Where you could bang against the guy. You could hide a little bit. You could, but yeah, you're in closer where you could get hit. But you also could smother. You also could tie up. You also could do other things. On the outside, you can't do that. It takes more discipline. I'm not going to say it takes more courage. It takes courage either place. But it definitely takes more professional discipline to stay outside and be the boss outside and not go inside and, and get it done. It, t it takes more discipline sometimes. Yeah, sometimes inside is the right place to be. But if it's the wrong place to be and the right place to be is on the outside, then you got to be on the outside. Why wasn't he on the outside? I'm giving you some possible answers to why. A lot of people would say Peter McDermott, you know, and I know he didn't belong in there with Tyson, but they're safe from Boston. McNeely. And, and listen, McNeely. Uh, McNeely. McNeely. Yeah, gutsy guy. Yeah, thank you. That's one of the reasons you're there, brother. Thank you. And, you know, he, uh, not the main reason. The main reason is because you bring something else. You bring something besides good looks and besides being a master at marathon. You bring good <laughs> conversation. You allow me to have somebody to bounce things with. But, Against against McNeely, whose father was a fighter, I think who fought, I believe his uncle or his father, I think his uncle fought Patterson for the title. Now, I believe so. So he comes from a family of fighters. And the guy's a gutsy guy. And he didn't belong in there with Tyson. Tyson's first fight after the being in prison. His first fight back. He was counter fodder. You know, uh, he, he was. But when he went after Tyson... A lot of people said, oh, what guts, what, what confidence to go after tight. That wasn't confidence. See, I'm, <laughs> this is where I got to correct people. This is where I got to educate people a little bit in my business. No, not that I'm smart and all, but, but I know something about this business. I don't pretend to be smart about everything, but I know a little something about life, and I know a little something, no more than anyone else, but sometimes a little more than someone else in, in boxing I do, and I understand more than what's happening on the surface. I understand more than the X's and O's. I understand what's happening beneath the surface, which is the most important place to understand what's going on there. And that's always the most important place, to understand what's going on there. And when he went after Tyson, he went after him to get it over with. Yeah, not because of the opposite of confidence. I'm not saying he's not gutsy, but it wasn't about guts. It definitely wasn't about confidence. It was about avoidance. Oh, yeah, I said it. Oh, Teddy, you said avoidance? Yeah, it was about avoidance. But he ran into it. How's he avoiding something if he runs? That's how you avoid it. You run into it and you get it over with. If you don't want to avoid it, you stay on the outside, you take your chances. You pick your spots. You see what you got to do. You make a miss. You do this. You got. But if you want to get something over with and you really aren't feeling you're equipped to deal with what you need to deal with, you sometimes go kamikaze and you get it over with. So, yeah, I put it all out there. And I don't know if some of this is happening with Chandler. I don't know. He's a gut, he's a warrior, he's a samurai. I got nothing but respect for the man. Anyone who could get into that octagon and fight the monsters he fight, you better have respect for him. Otherwise, there's something wrong with you. But I'm just trying to explain some things in the, in the mental areas, in the psyche areas, 
which are the most difficult areas to understand and to cope with and to explain things. They're the most difficult areas, but they're the most important areas. So that's what I'm trying to do. So at the end of the day, he makes, you know, he makes that mistake. Then we get to the second round. He gets on the floor. Dustin, well, before we get to the second round, you already touched on it. The end of the first round, Dustin comes back and unbelievable, unbelievable. But what does he do? He does what I talk about. We already know he knows how to fight like a champion. But he does the most important part that I always talk about. And I used to talk about on ESPN when I was broadcasting all the fights. He knows how to behave like a champion. There it is. There it is, Ken. Ken, there it is. That's it. That's the diamond. Oh, his name is Diamond. Oh, wow. (laughs) I didn't realize that. That's the diamond. That's the diamond in diamond. Okay? That he knows how to behave like a champion when the moment comes. And he behaved like a champion. He comes back unbelievable. Barnstormers. Comes back in that sec- uh, first round. And then the second round is Chandler. He get, gets him on the floor. It's all Chandler. And now it's an even fight. Maybe he's behind if it's 10-8. But it's, I don't know what the scorecards were. But it's an, it's a, you're going to find out. I get it. And so it's an even fight, let's say. He knows what he's got to do. And he hurts Chandler. Now, oh, before I get to that, there was one point I wanted to make. In the first round, that unbelievable round, when Poirier had his turn and he had Chandler hurt, I thought he made a mistake, you know, but a different kind of mistake. You know what kind of mistake I thought he made, Ken? What's that? I, I thought Dustin, when he had Chandler hurt at the end of the round, if he would have placed a body shot instead of everything to the head, he would have stopped him right there. I really mean it. I think he would have ended it right there and he wouldn't have had to deal with two more rounds. But then again, you know, he wouldn't be Dustin Poirier if he didn't go and deal with two more rounds that make us all thankful that he gave that he gave us two more rounds. Yep, scorecard was dead even going into the all second. Right, there it is. There it is. All three judges had uh, Dustin and, winning uh, the first okay, and, and Chandler so. winning the second. And there it is. So I thought the end of the first round, Dustin makes that mistake of not placing a body shot. If he places a body shot, I think he freezes the head of the head movement of the survival, the surviving ability of he takes away the surviving ability of Chandler and freezes him a little bit so he can catch him cleaner in the head and get him out of there. But anyway, he doesn't. Goes into the second round, loses the second round on a mat, and then comes out and does his thing. Behaves like a champion, fights like a champion, shows his versatility. I love what he said, and it was appropriate. What he said to to um, Rogan afterwards. Uh, I know jiu-jitsu. <laughs> you know, that was so great. Because we know him as a striker, we know him as a finisher, we know him on the floor too with the guillotine and all that, the naked choke. That's his signature. Nobody does it better. And he did it great. And he got the submission with that. But he's also known as a great striker. And, you know, he, and a great finisher. I think he's one of the best finishers. There's a lot of good finishers in the UFC. He's a really good one. One of the other things, I don't know if he said this in any of the other interviews, but he said to me, he got hit with a headbutt in the first round and he said he was almost out. He said it was so bad. He said, if he, if he hit me with a shot after I got hit with the headbutt, it would have been over. He goes, I was like, I lost my legs. No, it wouldn't have been. I'm going to tell you right now, Ken, that's where I'm going to differ. He's going to say that he's a gentleman. He's a gentleman. He's humble. He's a humble warrior. But he, he, it wouldn't have been over because he would have found a way. Because when nothing else works or when everything else goes bad, that's what these guys do. There was a fighter, one of the top fighters, he's still undefeated, I won't say his name, good guy, I like him. And he called me up and, he's, and he was picking my brain. Teddy, what about this? And he's running me through different scenarios. What do I do here? What do I do this? What do I do? And I'm giving him the answers. Boom, 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 boom. And then finally, he's a smart kid. What does he say? Teddy, What do I do if none of those things work? (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. What if none of the above works, Teddy? What do I do? You know what you do? (laughs) This was my answer. He thought he had me. He didn't have me. I had the answer. I'm in a fight game my whole life. I said, 
you find a way. And he immediately said, that's it. I said, you find a way. And and that's, Dustin would have found, and you do that in law, you do that as a doctor, you do that as a runner, with you as a marathon runner, with Rob as a marathon, you do that in as a producer, you do that as a teacher, you do that in the classroom, the courtroom, the life room. You find a way. You find a way. And he would have found a way. That's why he's a winner. At the end of the day, with his muscles, with his with his technique, with his great punching ability, everything else, his great chin, he's a winner because he finds a way. He will not, he refuses to capitulate. That's one thing you can, you don't capitulate, you find a way. You don't give in, you give out. You find a way. So anyway, it, he goes in that third round and he come, He finishes the comeback, right? He finished the comeback and, you know, he does it, he does it the way that he does it in an exciting fashion. Uh, and he puts himself right in the middle of the mix for a title fight, for another huge fight. You know, he's right there. He's right there. And he's a great lesson. He's a great lesson. He had some tough times with Oliveira, with Khabib, you go back far enough. With McGregor, you go back far enough. And what did he do? He didn't quit. He didn't feel sorry for himself. He went to the drawing board and he got better. He got better. He got better. He's not like some of the, I'm not going to name names, but he's not like some of these guys out there. And I remember I wrote him. I talked to him. I And, and, you know, talk about some of the things. Gave my little bit of, for what it's worth, of thoughts and of advice. And he was going through tough things. But what did he do? What did he do? He went back. He faced what he had to face. He corrected what he had to correct. And he went back at it. And he he found a way. He made it right. He's not like some of these 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 guys out there that are, really. And, and there's something to be said about that. That he wasn't brought up with a silver spoon. He he came up the hard way. You know, he, he wasn't like some of these fighters that are, are medalists in the Olympics. God, God bless him. That's a great accomplishment. It really is. And God bless him. But then with that, sometimes they get a promoter with all the money, with the network, and they get brought along, you know, in a very protected way, in a very easy way. They still got to fight. They still got to win fights. They still got to go into a dangerous place. I, I got it. I've been doing it 50 years. I got it. But they get taken care of more than some people do. They get taken care of. And then, God forbid, you dare to give them a little constructive criticism. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. How dare you? Nobody does that to me. Nobody does that to me. How dare you? Well, I'm trying to help you. Oh, how dare you? Oh, you're an enemy. But then you get guys like Dustin, and many of them, that are mature enough, real enough, honest enough. Because they had to face the truth early. A kid like I just described that gets angry, hey, talented kids, but they might have to face the truth later. Where it might have been better if they faced it a little earlier. Maybe, maybe. Because when you face it later, you realize later that you could have saved yourself a lot of hardship and a lot of trouble if there was somebody around to tell you some of that truth a little earlier. It might have saved you a little bit of what you're going through right now. And in the end, it might have paid off for you. It might have served you. It might have helped you. But guys like Dustin, they know that. They know that. And they appreciate whatever they have to learn and whatever is given to them and thrown to them because they got to claw and scratch and fight for every inch of what they get. So they appreciate somebody says, hey, you're doing it. I remember one time after the hooker fight. You remember that fight, what a war that was? uh, Oh, yeah. uh, uh, With with Dustin Hooker. Yeah, and I said, hey, Dustin, joking along with him, but serious. I said to him, you know, it's not, it's not against the law to move your head once in a while. And he laughed. 
You know, it's it's not against the rules to move your head after you punch once in a while. And he laughed. He goes, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Teddy. You know, I'm 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 working on it with my trainer, or I'm going to work on it with my trainer. My trainer is is saying the same thing, and he accepted it. He accepted it. Why? Why? Because he knows the truth. He knows the truth. You know, the truth will set you free. But hiding from the truth, it'll put you in a prison sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it will. So anyway, it was a great fight. It was a great night. Um, that's for the whole night. We're not done. But that's for our man, Dustin. That's for all of them. That's for all of them. Yep. For, for what they risk. For what they give us. For what they teach us. To teach us what's possible. That it's possible to go beyond yourself. That it's possible to demand more of yourself than you ever thought you could demand. Yep. It's possible to open up a new door in, your, in yourself and go into that room and find something you never knew was there. That's what these guys do. That's the yep. greatness to them. That, that on any given night, they might go further than they ever went before. Without knowing that, when they got to the garden, when they got to the dressing room, but being ready for that. In the co-main, Wei Li Zhang challenges Carla Espaza for the strawweight title, and much like the Molly McCann fight, this was one-way traffic right from the jump. Um, Wei Li Zhang puts it on Carla Espaza with the wrestling background, and uh, Rob pointed out before we went live on the air that... Um, Apparently, Wei Ling Zhang has been training with uh, legendary wrestler, a two-time Olympic gold medalist. Uh, was he, did he win two golds? No, he had the two titles in the UFC and a gold medal in the Olympics, at least one. I think he only had one. And uh, Henry Cejudo. And Henry Cejudo has been working with Zhang, and it looked like it. My God, did she put it on Carla. It was hard. It was actually hard to watch. I mean, just beat her up from start to finish. Finally got her in a... Um, with a very odd, almost like an inverted crucifix into a rear naked choke. She had basically was holding one of her arms with her legs and then choked her with the other arm and then eventually sank it in with both arms and locked in the uh, rear naked and choked her out. She tapped, um, you know, pretty uneventful aside from the fact that Wei Ling Zhang looked, uh, you know, as good as ever. Um, so it'd be interesting to see where she goes from here because clearly Rose Namajunas has Wei's... Uh, number and beat her twice but other than rose Wei Ling Zhang has been so dominant against everyone else um, how'd you like that one all right listen i'm gonna go through this one fast because it was fast and it was that dominant and it doesn't need anything more than what i'm gonna give it right now i thought the other fights did but zhang is so smart so dimensional See, I, I got to put in smart, not just strong, but she's so smart, so dimensional, besides being so damn strong. I'd like to know if anyone is better than Zhang. Um, because if there is anyone better than Zhang, or this version of Zhang, Saturday night, I would really like to know what planet they're from. I really would. <laughs> Venus, well, like I said, uh, Rose Uranus, got, Rose, uh, Rose has been twice. I, no, 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 no. I'm going to correct you. I'm going to correct what I'm saying. This is what I'm going to say. I'm not correcting you that you're giving misinformation. What I'm going to say is this. Listen to me closely. This version of mm -hmm. Zhang. Yes, I understand that the great Rose beat her twice. I get it. But I'm going to say it again. I know what I'm saying. This version of Zhang, I'd like to know who could beat, including Rose. I'd love to find out. Could Rose, and I don't know if she could beat this version again, what she showed that night. I don't know. Against, I mean, she went in there against a master on the floor, a master on the mat, and she threw her around like a rag doll. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I really. Throw yeah. around, uh, technically, physically, mentally, every way. Just tossed her around. Did what she wanted. I'd like to know this version, if this version ever shows up again. I don't know if this version of Zhang will ever appear again. And sometimes it's like Haley's Comet. It doesn't <laughs> come along again. 
for yeah. a long time. So I don't know. But if this version is here to stay for any length of time, I'd love to see Rose go at it again and see what happens. And and you know what? Like the great Forrest Gump said, and that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> All right, let's get into the main event. Our friend Israel Adesanya in action against Alex Perea. Man, this was a good fight. Izzy, um, I think it was at the end of the second, Izzy had him on, you know, had him on skates. He had him hurt bad. Bell saved, the Bell saved Perea. I think it was the second. If I'm wrong, it might have been the first, but I think it was the second. Um, going into the fifth, uh, all stand up. I think there were a couple little scrambles on the ground. Nothing of substance. Nothing uh, unexpected, Ken. These are stand up guys. Everything and, and, everything, and, and yeah. no pun, no pun intended. But these yeah. are stand up guys. Go ahead. And then they get we get to the fifth, and you know I, the crazy thing is, I said to you at one point, I said it feels like the tide is starting to push Perea around. It looked like Izzy was coming forward. Izzy was in control. They start the fifth round. Perea's coming forward again, coming forward again. Only this, and I said to Teddy Jr., who's sitting next to me, I said every time Izzy gets stuck on the fence, this guy starts lighting him up, and Izzy's looking for that right hand counter, and he's hurt him a few times, but that. On the fence, it looks like a dangerous position for Izzy to be stuck there. And sure enough, Perea gets him against the fence, clips him a shot, and then closes the show. Izzy, you know, maybe a little bit early on the stoppage. The ref jumps in and stop it before Izzy hit the ground. Izzy didn't like the stoppage. I could see making a case for that, but I mean, I, I don't, I don't have a problem with the stoppage. He had him hurt pretty bad. His eyes were rolling back for a second, and um, ref jumps in, waves it off to two minute mark, and uh, Alex Perea is the new champ. How'd you like it? All right, first of all, let's do a little cleanup here, um, just for the fans, because we give we try to give them the cleanup version. We try to give them stuff that they might not get somewhere else. Um, it wasn't, the stoppage was not too fast. He's a competitive kid. He said what a competitive kid would say. He doesn't want anything to be stopped, nothing to be stopped. And, and that's the right attitude. That should be his attitude. That should be his answer in the ring. But he's an honest kid. He's an honest kid to Zizzy. And what did he do? The great Olivia, um, the, or the great Megan Olivia, uh, she was doing the uh, one of the post-fight shows with me afterwards. And she said she did her job. She went back in the locker room. She went back and she talked to him. And she got the info that maybe someone else wouldn't have got. And she said that they watched it again together. And when he watched it again, he said, no, it was the right stoppage. It's Izzy, the fighter, the champion. He said, no, okay, he did the right thing. I was gone. So that's from the fighter's mouth. So he's an honest kid. So going into this fight, you, you've heard the saying, I said this, I tweeted it. By the way, my great, great, great tweeting team out there, you know, Brennan, Wood, Ian, uh, Ian Mackey, Rob Moore, I always try to shout them out when I can because I always appreciate them. They got the job done again. Matter of fact, it was funny. Um, speaking of Megan, she said to me, I love your tweets. I was like, you, you watch me? I love your tweets. <laughs> and then I had to tell the story. You know, we're, we're on the air. We're, we're doing a breakdown uh, for ESPN. And I said, yeah, you know, I uh, I have a tweeting team. You have a tweeting team? I, yeah, I have a Twitter team, the Teddy Twitter team. And I'm blessed. I have I have these guys that, you know, I write it up and they get it out for me. Um, come, come hell or high water, they get it out. So we had a little, uh, we got that out there. I... I thought going in, as I said, there's a saying in boxing, sometimes for a particular style, a particular dangerous puncher who Pereira was, it fits to say, tonight the guy's got to be able to have wheels and give angles. He's got to give angles. It made sense to think that Izzy having very good wheels would give angles. He'd give more bounce. It made sense. Because the guy had knocked him out before, beat him twice, but he knocked him out in kickboxing. And he's a real good puncher, accurate puncher. And 
you got to, you, the only way that a punch is really dangerous is if you give them a chance to be set. Then they're dangerous. If you don't let them get set, they're not, you know, you disarm the bomb. Basically, you pull the green wire out or the red wire. God knows I probably pull the wrong wire and blow us all up. Um, so you would have figured that he'd go in there looking to keep him off balance, not letting him be set to detonate the bomb. He didn't do that as much as you would have thought. He would he he did it a little bit, but he he kind of kept his ground a little bit, kept distance a little bit, used the jab. There were spots where it wasn't exciting, where there wasn't a lot going on. You know why? It was always exciting. I'll tell you why. There was suspense. You were just waiting for something to happen. So there was excitement that way. But anticipation, it's called. There was lulls during the rounds where neither guy wanted to give the other guy an advantage, Ken. Neither guy wanted to do something wrong that would create an opportunity for the other guy, which is smart. That's a moment, and I tweeted it, where whoever uses the jab is going to have an edge. And so I was looking to see who's going to do it. Now, Izzy used the jab pretty good in spots where he was getting an edge. Pereira used his in some spots where his jab was different. His jab was like George Foreman's. It was like a phone pole. It was like a telephone pole. I mean, you ever get hit with a telephone pole? <laughs> All I can tell you is don't. Don't. He, his jab is like, a, it really, it's, uh, Foreman's is like a battering ram. And that's what Pereira's is like. And he hit Izzy with a couple. And you could see, bang. It, it sent the message. It stabilized Izzy a little bit from pot shot and then moving on the outside. It controlled distance for him when he did it. I didn't think either one used that jab quite enough. But they took terms being effective with their jabs. Both of them. There were moments there. There was a lot that happened in that fight that really, in the end, told the story. Yeah, the one thing that stuck out immediately was the size difference, disparity. I mean, Pereira is so big. And I actually said that it reminded me of George Foreman and Muhammad Ali. And Pereira's George Foreman, of course, Izzy was Ali, where he could move a little bit, even though that night he played the rope with dope. But where he could move when he wanted to a little bit, and he had quick hands, he had the speed advantage, and you could see the speed advantage of Izzy. And you could see the right hand, just like Ali used the right hand to jolt Foreman. You could see that right hand effect of jolting, obviously, Pereira. I thought with all the things that transpired, there was like three things that really told the night. One was what you touched on already. When Izzy heard him at the end of the round, and he heard him with the right hand, he froze him with the jab, set him up, froze him with the left, blinded him, and then hit him with the right and then followed with the left hook and hurt him. Had him hurt. Now, if there's 10 seconds more in that round, my son corrected me. He said, Dad, five seconds. All right, five seconds more in that round. Maybe we're not having this discussion right now. And maybe the title hasn't switched hands. But it wasn't. Call it bad luck. Call it destiny. Call it fate. Whatever you want to call it. Call it history now. But it happens sometimes in this game. It happens in life sometimes. And the the punches that hurt him happened just before the bell. So he gets saved by the bell. Another thing that was going on that I don't think everyone noticed. I think the great Rogan and DC and John Attic probably noticed it. I was I was there at the garden, so I'm not listening to them. But the size. And the pressure that Pereira puts on, like George Foreman, keep coming forward. Keep pressing. Keep pressing. Keep pressing. That wears you. It wears. It's got a toll. There's a toll to that. There is. There's an erosion. 
You know how the salt water erodes your car, how it erodes the paint on your car if you leave it down the shore for a whole summer? Well, there's an erosion of, from pressure. Pressure breaks, I say it all the time, pipes, it breaks people. But it takes time. It takes time to build. You got a big guy walking you down, walking you down, walking you down, bang, with that jab. And he's walking you down with that, with that polarizing jab. You're feeling that pressure to keep him off you, to move, to box. It's mental pressure. It's physical pressure. It's wearing, Ken. Ken, it's wearing. How much did that play into effect? I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. It played. How much, Teddy? I don't know. It played, though. What degree? I'm not sure. But it's kind of like I would always say again when I was commentating on the fights. It would be like a hot summer day, Ken, in July. I know you don't see them too much because you're in one of your air-conditioned cottages, you know, somewhere. <laughs> so I'm outside for two hours every day. To no, run. no, I get it. I get it. Uh, you know, you have an air-conditioned bubble that runs with you. <laughs> but in all seriousness, on a July day, you can actually see this sometimes. You see a little puddle of water, and then you come back two hours later, no more puddle. Why? It got evaporated. Pressure evaporates people. It does. And it takes time. Just like the sun took two hours to get rid of that puddle, the pressure takes time to get rid of a man. And I think that constant pressure had a toll. I think it had a toll on Izzy. I don't know how much, but I think it did. And then, here's a part nobody talked about. And Izzy talked about it. And again, Megan Olivi talked about it. And you should watch it. It was on YouTube, uh, post-fight stuff, on ESPN YouTube, whatever the hell that is. And she talked about it. He, and Izzy talked about it. But it hasn't been really out there a lot. I think his leg got compromised. If you remember in that fifth round, very reminiscent of yes. what our buddy, the great diamond, Poirier did against McGregor in the rematch. He destroyed his leg. And then he got him to be more available where he could knock him out. He could find him. Where it was harder for Poirier, I mean harder for, for McGregor to do one of his signature moves. Step back and create space. Make you fall in and look to counter. Uh, he took his legs away. He took the wheels. He, he removed the air from the radials. And... Just it like a like box, it, it looked like it was a kick that Izzy threw, and then he stepped. No, no, back no, it, no! It was a kick from Pereira. It might have been a little bit of both, but Pereira threw a kick, and and it hit his it hit Izzy's leg. And uh, then and then Izzy toward, threw a kick, and when he stepped back, it was right well, after he threw the yeah, kick well, he stepped back. But yeah, Pereira but he, might he, have compromised it. But I he think fell it, back. He kicked it. Yeah. I think that he hurt him right there. Number one, he fell back and he did a backflip. Aerobic, yeah, rolled, and a, yeah. aerobic type, very athletic backflip. And we kind of dismissed it because it was Izzy. He's very athletic. He's like, sometimes he could be like Bruce Lee in there. We just said, wow, that's athletic, whatever. But if you really watch closely, after he does that backflip, after the kick, he stumbles a little bit. He gets out of the corner. He avoids a punch, but he stumbles a little bit. And it was moments after that that he stood in front of this guy, and then he gets caught. Now, the one thing we knew going in, if you know anything, if you don't have sawdust in your brain, the one thing that we knew, you can't stand in front of this guy too long because yep. he's a dangerous puncher. And like I would always say, again, when I'm commentating, I would always say, sometimes becomes a night where one guy is so dangerous where... One guy has to fight an almost perfect fight and there's no margin for error. He can't make mistakes. Where the other guy could make a mistake and still survive. Yep. I said that before the fight. That's exactly what happened. Not because I said it, because it happened. That's exactly what, and was almost mandated to happen. Izzy could not afford to make a mistake Pereira could make a mistake, and he did. He got hurt, but he survived it. And 
Izzy made a mistake and he didn't survive it. Again, it was the kind of fight there was no margin for error. And he gets, he's in front. Now, why is he in front of the guy? A lot of guys say, oh, he was this, he was that, he was arrogant, he was, you know, he was confident, he was, he was trying to show something, he was this. He was. No, no. I think everything I said in the last 20 minutes is part of it. I think the pressure, the size, constantly coming forward, I, I think all of that and there's one other. Remember I told you there was three key things? Key things that you're not going to hear nowhere else? I think all those things conspired against him. I think they all added up to victory for Pereira and to a finish because it was three Three to one, I think, going into the fifth round. So Pereira needs, and his corner yeah, did a good job. All three judges had a three to one. And his corner did a good job. They did their job. A lot of times, corners don't tell the truth. They lie to their guys. They want to stay friends. They want to keep getting a paycheck. They, well, uh, you know what I say about that? Freak you. Freak you. Your job is supposed to be to tell the truth. Freak you. This corner told the truth. They said, you want to be a champion? You got to go out and get him. You want to be a freaking champion? This is your chance to be a champ. Go get him. Go knock him out. He went out there and he put the pressure. And again, he got, I think, his leg got compromised a little bit. I don't know how much. And he's standing in front. And again, I think it's an accumulation of the pressure, the size, the leg being kicked, um, all of that. And one other thing, Ken. I said it before the fight. I say it now. Ghost. Yeah, I know it's not Halloween, but ghost. Yep. I think ghost showed up. Yeah, I, I think, think right. that I I think that one of the things he needed to do and he was trying to do in the camp before this fight was exercise the ghost. The ghost from his last time in the ring with this guy where he got not cold. Those ghosts, they rattle around in the attic. By the way, the attic, it's our brain. They rattle around in the attic. It's not good to have ghosts in the attic. It's not good. And you know when ghosts show up? They show up late when the lights are getting dim. They do. They show up when it's getting dark, late. And you know when the ghost might have showed up here? Late. The fifth round. With his leg hurting, with, with everything going on, the, the round ended uh, at the end of the round, he hurts the guy, but the guy gets out of safe by the bell. All those things mentally, mentally, 75% of this game, mental. All those things might have added up. They might have been working on Izzy a little bit. And now, guy, the bell rings, it saves him. He's big, he keeps coming forward. My leg gets hurt. Uh, all of that, all of that. And then the memory. Wow. Is this the guy that I can't beat? Is this is there something to and I'm sure he's chasing those ghosts. I'm sure he's chasing them, you know? But he might have needed the Ghostbusters. Really. To really get rid of them. And between all of those things, and I take nothing away from Pereira. He's the one who made me able to talk about these things. But with all of those things going on, I think you add them all up. And you got a guy who's not supposed to stand in front of a dangerous guy who already knocked him out. All of a sudden, you have that scenario. All of a sudden, you have that unlikely situation that you thought you might not see because you're not supposed to see it. Not if he's going to win. Not if he's going to win. And then all of a sudden, he's in front of him. And listen, give credit to Pereira. Why, Teddy? Well, for a lot of reasons. You already know why. He survived getting hurt. He he was behind. He didn't get frustrated. He didn't give up. He didn't give in. It was very reminiscent of 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 our buddy Edwards, who was on our air, when he knocked out Usman. Same situation. Way behind. Fifth round. Supposed to be, you know, just a matter of time before the bell rings and then, you know, you hear, and still, and still, champion of the world, right? Usman, and still, champion of the world, Adesanya. But no, instead we got, and knew, 
And that's how you get and new. You get and new by being a guy that goes in there not intimidated, not going in there, you know, saying I'm the underdog I get or that or even when it gets late, even when it gets late and he's behind, not saying, Okay, I gave it my best. No. You get the end new with a guy that says, It ain't over yet. It ain't over yet. And I ain't leaving here to have that thing over there. What's that thing? That thing over there, that belt. I ain't leaving till I have that belt over there. That's how you get and new. And that's how you get it in anything in this world. In any vocation in this world. That's how you get it. By never saying never. By never saying never. By never saying no. Uh, that's enough for tonight. No, it's not. No, it's not. And it wasn't for him. So I, I think that all of that was part of this, this sensational win for Pereira. I tell you, I, I, I like Izzy a lot as a human being and, and uh, as a fighter, as an athlete. He came on our show a couple times, his, his corner, his trainer, Eugene, they're all good people, all of them. He's got a, and I'm not being facetious here, you know, I heard that Megan was telling me that he was watching Saw movies on um, the week of, because he knew what he was dealing with, and he was watching horror movies, but, but that speaks loudly. See, we didn't hear a lot about that. That speaks to his psyche. It does. For me, I look at that stuff. Because in my business, you got to be a psychiatrist, not just a trainer. You have to be. If you only know the X's and O's, you know, you know squat. You know diddly. you got to know the mind, not just the X's and O's. Yeah, I know the X's and O's. Yeah, I'm a good teacher. Yeah, I understand the technique. Yeah, I understand the physicality. But you got to understand this, the mind, where it all plays out, in that dark place that sometimes gets too dark. And... When he's watching horror movies the week of that he told Megan he was watching Saw and all that, getting ready, what are you getting ready for? He knew that he's, I get it. I get the way, he, you know, he, I'm getting ready for, you know, uh, a guy that was like a horror movie to me that knocked me out. So I'm watching horror movies. But is that what you really want to be watching? You really want to be watching horror movies? Or do you want to be watching maybe, you know, The Exorcist? I, I don't know. I, I'm just I'm just drawing. But do you want to watch how you get rid of the horror? Do you, do you want to watch the Ghostbusters? You know, well, that's a little different than, you know, watching a Saw movie, that's for sure. You could laugh and you could smile. But you could get rid of the ghost. And listen, I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but I'm being serious too. The mind, the mindset going in a lot of people don't realize the week of the fight you're right you could lose it right in the week of the fight by going to the wrong place you could even get the wrong visitor comes into your locker room ken you know how i am i i, I want to know who comes into my locker room well, i don't want the wrong guy coming in some 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 idiot some some dope coming into the locker room and saying the wrong thing to my fighter not realizing it's the wrong thing before the fight the mind the mind Every part of that's important. And I don't know if some of those things went array or not. He's, he's got great people around him. Izzy is, Izzy's a champion. He was ready. But he never had to deal with this before. This was new for him. Dealing with the ghost. Dealing with the ghost. You know, he never got beat before. His only loss in the UFC was he went up to light heavyweight and he lost the decision to 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 Blahovich, who was tremendous and big and strong, too big for him, and, and very good, very good technically on the floor. He knew what he was doing too. And he knew how to handle himself even striking. And um and he was able to beat Izzy. But other than that, Izzy never lost. So he's facing a guy that he not only lost to, but he got Knocked out with. So this, I'm telling you, there's certain guys out there in any field, doesn't have to be fighting, that I'm sure there's a lawyer that if the, if he saw a certain lawyer on the other side, he'd say, oh, 
<laughs> oh, oh, uh, okay, let me go to bed for four minutes. You know, and then he'd go throw up, but he'd come out, and if he's the real deal, he'll win the case. Yeah, I said it. He'd throw up. It's okay to throw up. As long as you do the right thing after you throw up. It's okay. Because it's okay to be scared, as long as you control the fear. And so there's certain boogeymen out there. You know, I know I teach my grandson, you know, I open up the car. Look, there's, there's nobody in here. Look, there's no boogeyman. Right? We teach our kids that. We love them. And it's true. We teach them that. But in the mind, there are boogeymen in some people's minds. And fighters, I know many of them, Ken, that have boogeymen. That a bunch of them that they lost to the guy, believe it or not, in the amateurs. And they couldn't beat them in the pros. And they should have. They should have. They were good enough. They were better but they, they couldn't beat them in the pros. So that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> and and, and my, pretty... mama, my mama always said, life is like a box of chocolates. You just <laughs> never know what you're going to get. Well, we know what we're going to get on Thursday, and I know you've got a lot of pre last minute preparations for the uh, Dr. Atlas dinner. Like I said, we'll be there, myself, Rob. Dustin Poirier, a whole host of people. Stephen A. Smith's going to be a fun night, and um, Max Kellerman, uh, oh, Phil Max Sims Kellerman, from the New York nice. Giant, from the New York Giants, Marv Albert, the great Tracy Morgan. Do I have to go more? <laughs> I mean, there's many more. There's many more, and they're all good people, good human beings, accessible. Um, and you know what? Their greatest talent is Ken. I'm going to say this that night, but I'm going to say it to my audience right now. You know what their greatest talent? We have comedians up there. We have football players, baseball players, basketball players. We, we have marathon run. I'm putting you on the dais, kid. I'm putting you on the day. You belong I there. I appreciate you. you uh, we have all these people that have great, great talent. And you know what their greatest talent is that night? Their talent to be a human being. That's it. That's their greatest talent. And that's, that's what they're bringing to the room in order to help other people that are in much more desperate difficult situations than they ever than than those people ever dreamed they would be in yeah much just situations that we're all fortunate we're not in that That's we're right. not in yeah. so it's, it's going to be a great night and looking forward to seeing all the fans and all the people that come every year. And with that, Teddy, we covered it all. And we'll look forward to doing it again next week and we'll break down the Dr. Atlas dinner. Thank you to everyone for being with us. And Teddy, good luck with everything on Thursday night. Uh, looking forward to seeing you there. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. 